Okay. Uh, yesterday we kind of um, finished chapter three, so today we will start discussing chapter four a little bit. Um, It is uh, called event production. Uh, let me start by quoting uh, from the textbook here. Classical production planning of the lot sizing type is not very relevant in event logistics. The reason ought to be obvious. Deciding how much to produce of each product and when to change from one product to another is surely not the most relevant event logistics decisions. Artist booking or artist sequencing may certainly be relevant, but uh, we will treat these subjects separately in a later chapter, in chapter 10 here. Aggregate planning or workforce, wor workforce planning modeling may, however, be relevant in the event situation as well. The ability to plan correct usage of either an existing workforce, using higher labor or volu volunteers, may definitely be a problem that most event producers are facing. Especially the choice of volunteers is very relevant for small and medium-sized event producers. Or we should probably add in Norway, as we discussed yesterday, this volunteerism kind of thing is perhaps more of a Norwegian thing than more of a global thing. So the objective in this chapter is, is uh, kind of try, try to sum up, uh, summed up at the bottom here. Uh, Re-engine the aggregate production planning model from classical logistics to fit the event situation. Now if we think back about the aggregate production planning problem, then there was some variables there, okay? And there was variables on how much to produce of a given product. We looked at a kind of single product model and we had some kind of links between the number of workers we had and how much each worker produced. We also had the inventory there, so we kind of could store product in between periods, which is of course is typically not very relevant in the event setting, these inventory parts. We also had these subcontracting options, overtime options, undertime options, and uh, it was uh, also variables related to the workforce. How many people to hire and how many people to fire. In most practical one-shot events, you normally will not bother so much about hiring and firing. Because if you, if you, you kind of make a decision on building an organization to kind of serve a given event, it's relatively rare that you kind of hire and fire based on logistic reasons. Of course, you can fire people hire new people, uh, but that's uh, perhaps mainly due to, 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 uh, to people who cannot do the work they should or they kind of misconduct or whatever. So, uh, but if you think about kind of repeated events, then it's kind of uh, more interesting because then you, then you, if you look at the Jazz Festival, for instance, they have this kind of pool of volunteers and each year they kind of make decisions on which volunteers to choose, how many, and so when to, to face them in, into the festival, that kind of stuff. And at the same time, of course, they have the kind of running organization. There are certain professionals, we could call them, who kind of work at the festival as, as a kind of main profession. And there are also people who kind of have limited contracts, either related to the initial phase of a festival, planning, or after the festival for, for kind of tidying up. So. Uh, this workforce planning part seems relevant also in event management or in event logistics. So what we try to do now is kind of try to take this original aggregate planning model from the Namias textbook and try to change it slightly to kind of capture more relevant parts of events. And uh, the main way we will do this is to kind of open up for adding a feature we actually discussed when we discussed this in the first part of the course, where we said that if you really want to make a sensible practical model here, you kind of have to partition your workforce into different groups. Uh, there are, in most real situations, not a single pool of workers. Okay, there are this pool of workers is divided into different categories with different competence, different certificates, 
or what you like to call it. And there may be demands on certain parts of the work that certain people need to have certain cert certificates, for instance, to be allowed to, to do it. And of course, in the event setting, uh, you will probably not put any volunteer to run the sound on a concert. That needs some kind of expertise, okay? And of course, the sound is extremely important when it comes to a concert uh, uh, and the spectator's ability or satisfaction. Uh, you will probably not put any volunteer to, to make uh, at least food of certain compli com complications, so you need some expertise in various parts of your work, and, and you kind of need to sort that out when you plan how to to um, to um, to set up your final workforce pool. Of course, in big mega events like Olympic Games, for instance, uh, they run for a fair amount of time. They could run for two weeks. Uh, maybe three weeks. And these events, they seem to be constantly expanding. Now, for instance, they are kind of changing the European football championships, including more teams, changing. So it, it kind of opens up for more complex planning problems. You probably know that the next European football championships will not be kind of arranged in the single location. It will be arranged in a set of European cities. So you kind of distribute the whole event instead. Of course, this may be relevant if you want to capture more audience and try to spread it to more countries. On the other hand, it obviously opens up for more challenging, uh, more challenges when it comes to handling the logistics. If uh, Sweden, for instance, if they will kind of keep certain matches in Stockholm and later matches in, say, Paris, of course, some Swedes would like to travel from. So it, it opens up some, uh, some complexities when it comes to the logistics side. Okay, some obvious points in an event version. Inventory, no need for it here. Uh, we cannot produce the event now and use it tomorrow. That is kind of obvious. Even though, of course, we can kind of make substitutes, tape it or whatever, we, we still cannot, we cannot produce today what should be staged tomorrow. Of course, we can rehearse and do everything, but the actual production cannot be performed and then stored and then used again. Uh, a simple way of treating that is just, of course, to, to remove these inventory variables from the original model. Uh, and it says further on here that these would, however, lead to a banal model, meaning that if you kind of take this original model and kind of take the inventory out, then there's really not much back, is it? Because if there's no point in making inventory, then there's no point in kind of hiring more people to build the inventory. So given that you kind of remove the inventory variables from this original aggregate planning model, there is kind of just silliness left in the sense that you know the solution already, don't you? Because then you will have to produce the exact amount in each period to cover the demand. And if you can't, then your problem is, is simply infeasible. So, we will need to do this, but of course then we will need to add some more to make it a sensible and interesting model. Okay? That is kind of the deduction we can make from, from this argument. So, to make an interesting model, we must add some new features. And as I already have said, uh, a reasonable thing to look at then is to kind of look at work groups. Uh, and, and it says here it seems like an obvious candidate. For instance, in a very simple setting, you can have a professional group and a volunteer group. And of course, the questions you would like to answer then is kind of how many professionals would you like at each time step in your event? And how many volunteers would you like to have at each time step in your event? We can, of course, try to say something general about different cost structure related to these two groups. We could say that, in general, professionals cost a lot more. Of course, professionals, they need salary, and of course that incurs costs, as opposed to the volunteers who typically do this for free, or at a kind of marginal cost, some presents, or free travel, or whatever. But, as it says here, of course, uh, the reason why we hire professionals is that they cannot do something which these volunteers cannot do. 
So uh, in this model setting, you kind of kind of link this up in the sense that professionals have a kind of higher productivity than the volunteers, and kind of at least in certain tasks. If you if you want to split it into different types of tasks, and of course it could be stricter in the sense that certain tasks may perhaps only be performed by specialized professionals, like this example of a kind of sound engineer. Uh, you need to know something about this to be able to do it. Okay, I don't know whether if any of you have ever tried. To, to run sound for an event, it, it's not straightforward. There's a lot of uh, knots to turn on, okay? And if you turn on the wrong ones, uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't sound very nicely. So this is kind of expertise work. So this is kind of the setting we do now. We kind of remove something from the model and add some, something else to kind of build a model that makes sense. Now let's look at what I did here, just as a kind of simple starting point, okay? Uh, now we introduce these work groups and in order to do that of course we have to change some of the parameters and some of the variables in the model. And uh, obviously in the original model we had a kind of single parameter here reflecting the kind of cost of production and when we now introduce different groups of workers we kind of have to make these depending on each group. So we introduce a kind of set of work groups here where which have a sub subscript J. So this CRRJ then is the production cost or if you like salary per unit production in in each of these work groups. Of course the same seems reasonable to open up when it comes to hiring and firing. And of course we need to kind of have a label on the productivity here, if this should make any sense. If of, if of course the product productivity is the same, we probably will choose the cheapest ones anyway. Okay, so we need some kind of productivity measures here, which kind of separates between the groups. As a consequence, of course the variables will change as well. Then we need variables which are linked to each group. If there is a different cost in hiring from different groups, of course we'll have to, to kind of measure up how many we hire from different groups. The same on the firing side and of course we also need to to introduce different uh, number of employees as a total here in each group. And this also holds for the I misprint it should be a small t for the amount produced in time period t by each worker from each work, work group j. So this kind of sets up uh, a new dimension, if you like, in this aggregate planning model where we kind of simply introduce work groups. And it's not very difficult to see how the model must change. Now this is a changed version and as you can see, I've kind of taken out a lot of these original variables. The inventory variables are taken out, as discussed. The same with these over and under time. Of course you could have included over and under time, but to make it simple I kind of picked that out. The same goes for the subcontracting part. Again, of course, you can use subcontractors as an event producer, and many do that, but uh, to kind of keep this simple, I just pinpoint the main points here. So I, of course, keep the hiring and firing variables, and uh, as I now have a set of groups, I have to have a double sum here. I have to sum up overall time periods, and I have to sum up over all groups to construct the total cost, obviously, multiplying as before. So this is kind of a subset of the original objective, but I, I add sum outside it to kind of sum up over both time periods as well as work groups. And this capital J here is of course the number of different work groups in general. Now when it comes to the workforce balance for each of the work groups in each of the time periods I can in the same way as before construct the number of workers I kind of have in each group. I just take the previous number add the number hired and subtract the number of hired. That is the same. Okay? The only difference is that we introduce this J subscript here. The same holds for our product productivity uh, relations. So the pro produced amount is now constructed by a kind of variable productivity factor for each group times the number of workdays times the number of workers. This is in principle just the same but we just make it dimension dependent. The main difference now of course is that we, we have 
different production from different group, but we still only produce one product here. Okay? In reality, we would have another dimension on this one, wouldn't we? Because there are sub-products here in, in our event. Some do this, some do that, and we kind of need to have separate demands. Okay? We have a certain demand for sound engineers, we have a certain demand for catering people and so on. Okay? So you see the simplification here still? You kind of keep just one demand, a total demand, but to kind of cover this now, we assume that, that all these work groups kind of add together to cover the demand. So we have to add up all production from all groups to construct our total supply, if you like, and that should match our demand. So, so this model uh, will kind of rely on the fact that there are differences in the productivity. If not, it would still be banal. But the next step here is, is relatively straightforward. You'd have to spread this D into different types of jobs. Okay? And then you can kind of, kind of add to, then you'd have several of these ones. You, then you have a certain demand for type 1, a certain demand for type 2 and so on. You had several that you'd have to add together to kind of reach uh, your objective. So uh, what we did now was kind of try to, to use a classical aggregate production planning model from logistics and try to kind of change it to at least fit certain parts of a more event-oriented situation. But still, as I said, it's quite banal in a sense. Okay? We, we didn't kind of go the whole way through here. And of course, if we had kind of taken another step here, introducing different demand groups, then we would probably also have to look into what we are saying at the bottom here. That certain tasks may only be performed by specialized professionals. So there are certain work, work groups that could do certain tasks, or they cannot do those. And it could be that certain tasks need people with more than one qualification, if you like. Uh, the oil business has a lot of problems like this. Okay? You want people that should do various tasks on the platform. They need a security course. They need some basic education in the, the thing they need to do. They need some experience. So all these kind of demands must have to be met before people actually are allowed out there to do work. Uh, and that, of course, complicates this model even further, because then you would have to introduce some, typically some binary variables, to kind of couple up within these groups. But I haven't kind of taken it that far in this example. Okay, let's look at an artificial toy example. Now, to kind of show you how this works, uh, I just introduced some, should we say, toy numbers here. And I look at the situation where we have only two work groups, professionals P and volunteers V. And the assumptions are that the professionals, they cost more by salary, they are kind of expensive, but they are cheaper both to hire and fire. Do you think this seems like a reasonable assumption? Uh, logically, I would expect uh, that if you want to start a hiring process of volunteers, then you may put some more effort into getting those people, because they're not, get, they're not getting paid, are they? So, so they might be harder to get, okay? That would, that would kind of make a bigger hiring cost as compared to the professionals. The same, of course, on the firing side. If you first are able to get people convinced that they would like to be volunteers, then if you actually show them out, then they get kind of annoyed, okay? So this, that could produce a lot of problems in the actual firing process. So, so this seems like a kind of reasonable assumption that uh, even though the, the link between reality and actual numbers for the costs here are not obvious, uh, it doesn't seem like a very bad assumption. So we have a situation now, okay? We have some professionals. They cost a lot by their salary or their production cost, if you like. On the other hand, they are kind of cheap to hire and fire. As compared to the volunteers, who are very cheap on the production side, but are kind of costly when it comes to hire and fire. So the question is then kind of how to mix these groups. 
at the same time, we have this productivity, which we can kind of tune, okay? So, uh, the assumption here that is that, of course, as you would expect, that professionals are, are, are more productive than volunteers, and we do this simply by just signaling a double productivity on the professionals as compared to the volunteers. So, you see the numbers here? The production cost is high here, small here, but these numbers are bigger than these numbers to kind of signal the difference between higher fire between the two groups, while, while the professionals are more productive. So there are kind of three different mechanisms working together here. There is a production cost mechanism, there's a higher and fire mechanism, and there's a productivity mechanism. Two of the mechanisms here favor the professionals. Okay, they are cheaper to hire and fire, and they have more productivity. While a single one favors the volunteers, they are cheaper. They are kind of worse on these other two dimensions. If you want to kind of think of these as a single dimension, and these as a single, and these as a single. Of course, given these numbers and given this model, we can solve this again, writing out the model, putting it into lingo, okay? Just in the same way as we did on the aggregate production planning example. And uh, in order to do that, we need a little bit more input. We need some demands. And uh, I've just uh, constructed uh, 20 in the first period and 50 in the second period. In a sense, differences to kind of emphasize that we normally in events have larger demand in the end of the event than in the start of the event. This is of course not a perfectly complete rule, it could vary somewhat, but in general that seems to, to be how events are organized, especially if they run over a weekend. You kind of put your best artists in the end. And then we need to make some statements on how many people do we have before we start. And I've just put five professionals in and no volunteers. To again, to kind of embrace what we would expect to some extent from reality. That you have some kind of running organization which have some people running, working all the time, these five guys, and they kind of are all kind of entering up to the event and they would like to kind of find out whether they should, should increase their own group and possibly add some other from another group of volunteers. So now we have kind of all the information we need. We have the demands, we have these initial values for the workforce, we have the cost elements, so we have kind of defined everything we need to, to formulate the model. And if you uh, look here, uh, I have taken up the solution. Uh, I believe that the actual model definition in Lingo should be in an appendix, or maybe not. Let us see. Yeah, that's in Appendix E in the textbook, okay? The actual model formulation is there. You see the numbers there, 100 times HP1 and so on. And then you have these uh, workforce relations and, uh, and the productivity relations, as well as the demand relations. Okay. Uh, if you look at the solution here, it turns out that no volunteers are used. You can see this, that you have a, a red uh, rectangle there, which kind of uh, underlines the fact that uh, HV1, HV2, hiring volunteers in the first period is zero, hiring volunteers, HV2, in the second period is zero, so of course then you don't fire anybody else, and of course you don't produce anything from the volunteers either, okay? So this is the how many volunteers we hire in the first period, how many we hire in the second period, how many we fire in the first period, of course, as we don't hire one, we, we can't fire one either. Firing in the second period, this is the production values. So you see, all production here is done by our professionals. So we kind of get the corner type of model here, corner type of solution, where everything is done by the professionals. Uh, now, what I'm doing now is I, I just want to test what happens here. So, uh, let us assume that we increase the cost of professionals. If we make professionals more costly, 
then we would expect at some point you would start hiring volunteers. Okay? And we cannot get this effect here. Uh, what I do here is very simple. I, uh, I just increase this CPR, or the production cost, for professionals from 10 to 1,000. And uh, the consequences are shown here. Now we suddenly change all around. So now suddenly no professional professionals are hired. HP1 and HP2 are zero. We fire all the ones we have in the first period. The five we had, remember, from the start, they are kind of showed out. And we don't produce anything, but we hire up the necessary amount of volunteers in uh, period one and period two. And of course we don't fire these ones, and we then produce the necessary amount uh, uh, by these volunteers. So you see, we kind of get the solution we expect here, okay? When we have a relatively cheap set of professionals, we use the professionals. When we have an expensive set of professionals, then we use the volunteers. But uh, we kind of don't see this mixed solution that we see in reality, do we? Where you have both professionals and volunteers. What do you think is the reason for that? One reason could be that they have increased the cost too much, perhaps. If we had increased it less, we could kind of hope for a kind of mixed solution. But uh, I believe, though I haven't proved it, that this type of model would only produce either only professionals or either only volunteers. And the reason is, of course, that you kind of don't have these demands on these groups, okay? That certain people must be used to produce certain items. Because if you've had that here, that you, you need some professionals okay, to kind of do some professional work, then they, they would have to be included together with the volunteers. And of course, in that sense, this model is far too simple. It's kind of, as it says here, a kind of toy model. But it kind of lays out a way of kind of continuing to, if you really want to do this kind of work in a, should we say, scientific manner. A final note here. We have, seen, we have not seen a three-hour simplified model example, the classical mix, as I said, between professionals and volunteers. The reason should be obvious. Certain tasks in event production must have eligible professionals. For instance, you would not or should not use inexperienced sound engineers if you produce concerts, as I have already discussed. So our model concept is still oversimplified. We need to add constraints related to certificates, for instance, such that certain jobs need certain qualifications. And again, of course, this is not easy in reality, is it? Because in some cases you may be lucky and find volunteers who kind of know this job, even though they, you, didn't, you didn't know that they could do it. And this is kind of things you learn as you move along. But what we can be certain on is that the old days with events with very limited professionalization is kind of changing now, okay? So we see more and more events which are kind of prof professionalized, meaning that you need to have a certain organization, you need to have certain people hired who actually are there all the time, and um, that kind of needs to, be, needs to be handled in one way or, or another. If you ask me whether any event producers use these methods, I'm fairly certain that they don't. Of course, the next question then is why? The problem is, of course, that even professional manufacturers tend not to use these models. So again, you kind of see this gap between research and, and reality. And the problem by using these models are many. You need to be able to formulate them sensibly. You need to be able to know about solution, proce solution procedures. You need to capture a lot of data. These data you need to capture may not be present and it may be costly to obtain. Of course, all this adds up with extending the costs. And of course, most event producers do not kind of have very, very large budgets for these kind of stuff, okay? So they, they kind of tend to, 
to, to try to solve problems as they come. So uh, we see a lot of improvisation when it comes to actual event planning. And there's nothing wrong with improvisation if it's done good. What I try to tell you here is that there is alternatives to improvisation. But these alternatives may be complex to do. In any case, knowing about these alternatives is always an advantage. Even though they never will be, be used, they, they kind of put some building bricks into you, which kind of makes you different from a general, normal, average kind of event producer, and you have some more knowledge, some more information. You know a little bit more on what is possible. And if you understand what I told you now, you also know that even though it's possible, it may not be optimal to actually do it. Because if the costs involved with doing it are larger than what you kind of gain by doing it, of course you shouldn't do it. But you don't know this before you try. At least sit down and, and think about it. Uh, this kind of problem is not, as I briefly mentioned previously, is kind of not only relevant in event production. It's typically very relevant in all kinds of modern production, which is not of the mass production type. Uh, most modern production is, is often project-oriented, as we say. So instead of kind of having a running organization, if you want to build a new boat, you kind of set up a new project. If you want to build a new oil platform, you set up a new project. And each of these new projects will have to make these decisions. Okay? They need to find out how many people to hire, how many people to fire, what kind of qualifications do you need. So there's a huge process. And these mega events, like the Olympic Games, of course, they have these kind of thoughts involved. Whether it's formal or not, I would not... I should not guarantee, but uh, at least to some extent, uh, people think about this, okay? What people do we need? How many volunteers do we need? What kind of volunteers do we need? Do we need different types? How many in each group? And so on. All these decisions must be made. But again, of course, there is uh, good timing options here. So if we want to arrange an Olympic Games in Norway in 2022, there is still a lot of time left, okay? We are only in 2013 now. So there is still nine years left of planning. So um, you can do a lot of planning uh, manually, so to speak, without using these kind of methods. But they open up a kind of different way of thinking. But uh, be aware now of what I have told you. This model is extremely simple. Okay, it uh, typically uh, or. Uh, expectedly would kind of pr pr produce two types of results, either only volunteers or either only professionals. To kind of get what you observe in reality here, mixtures, you need to add complexity to this kind of model. Uh, as you know, I'm lazy, so I didn't do this in the <laughs> when I wrote this book. Uh, and it, it, it was due to some time constraints as well. I was kind of, I had to finish before, before the course started. But of course, in a, in a second edition, I would kind of look into this and kind of try to formulate more relevant models. Uh, but they kind of get uh, a little bit more tricky, so to speak. So remember that this is not a model you should use in reality. Okay? If, you, if you actually want to use it, you must make it more complex related to what we discussed. And it's typically these demands on, uh, on various qualifications which would which, which change it. Okay, if you like, of course, you can try to prove me wrong and take this model and try to change these costs slightly upwards from 10, bit by bit, and see if you find a solution where you actually mix. Of course, you will find one, won't you? Because at some point, it wouldn't matter what you do here, okay? Either it, it kind of costs the same to use volunteers, or, and then you get an infinite amount of solutions. And you can pick any combination you like, okay? But that's not the kind of solution I'm looking for, okay? I'm looking for kind of a strict solution where it, it's optimal to kind of mix it. But of course, if you like, you can try. It's, it's just taking the model, putting it into Lingo, uh, changing these costs from 10, 11, 12, and at some point it will flip. You move from the, and at exactly that point, you will find a kind of myriad of different solutions. At least I expect so. Maybe I'm wrong. This is research. You can try it if you like. And of course, uh, 
if you want to publish this kind of research, this is not enough. Then you have to make a mathematical proof on why it, why it is like this. That, that's kind of more difficult. Okay, that was chapter four. So, do you have any questions? Was this clear? Of course, at the next time I can try to, 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 to push you and try to, to maybe I should formulate a different version of this model where I kind of introduce this and ask you to comment on it whether it's sensible or not. That is an option, okay? I mean, that is the kind of thing you can get on the exam. It may, it, it may be difficult, but uh, we will see, okay? Or I can give you an output from a lingo and ask you to say well, what, what is the meaning of this. And so on, okay? Okay, if there's not any questions, I think we take a break now and then we meet in 15 minutes for uh, discussing the next two chapters. <laughs>